If you look at Google Maps, it's one of the only big giant wetland areas. And so when we were thinking like, ooh, where are snow kites gonna show up next? This was an obvious choice. Payne's Prairie is a big, kind of almost like a bowl, like a bathtub. And so you get water that drains from many different parts of the county into the prairie. It has a, a sinkhole, the Alachua Sink, and that's one of the main drain for the bathtub, if you will. And if that can get clogged or partially clogged, that really slows down drainage. And then we had a, a couple big hurricanes and a lot of flooding. And so Paints Prairie is it, still pretty flooded from hurricanes from years ago. All right, if you're a meteorologist in Florida, you're it's gonna busy. be a busy weekend. This morning, the worst flooding in nearly a century. So this is like 2016. And everyone was like, oh, it would be so cool if a kite showed up on the prairie. And my friend Isabel was in town and she was like, do you want to go birding with me at Sweetwater? And I was like, yeah, you bet I do, because I never turned down an opportunity to go birding. And we did, and we were rounding the corner and we both looked to the side at the same time. And there was this snail kite sitting on a fence post, just playing around, extracting a snail. And we both looked and we were like, Oh my God, it's a snail kite. Like we freaked out. And then one bird turned into three and which turned into another bird carrying nesting material and, and things just skyrocketed from there. We have this issue and this is the biggest issue with snail kites. We have an invasive snail in the system. It's one of the hundred worst invaders in the world. But where snail kites are concerned, it's like nearly identical in shape, like dimension kind of, to the native snail. So snail kites are able to access it and to eat it. And they do, they eat it a lot. Kites need to forage in areas where there are like emergent grass-like stems because the snails are crawling up the vegetation. I feel like they have two foraging modes. They have a sit and wait mode you'll see them perched on something and they just sit and watch the water and snails will crawl up the vegetation and when a kite sees it it'll take flight and do a short flight and a shallow plunge into the water with both feet extended and it'll grab the snail and then kind of give one strong flap to push straight up and then flop off with the snail hopefully and it'll perch on a post or somewhere that's kind of big so it can like balance and hold the snail and extract it. And then the second thing they'll do is this course hunting where it's the same thing, but to find the snail, they circle around and make these slow, lazy flights about like, you know, 20 or 30 feet off the surface of the water. This is from digging way back in the literature, but it tells you something. So like in the 1800s to mid 1900s, kites were mostly in the Everglades, but there, there were these records from Alachua County, from down near the Orlando area. And the problem is that people didn't have airboats. And so they can't like just go out into a wetland. Like there's no way you would try to walk across Payne's Prairie right now. Like you'd probably die. And then you move into these eras in the late 60s to the mid 90s, there was a lot of habitat degradation that happened at that time. And at that time, the snail kite population was already listed as endangered and it was pretty low. And even though recovery efforts were underway, human modification of the landscape made it hard for the species to really thrive. And so then enter like the mid 90s and we're still having these problems and most of the range again is still concentrated down in the Everglades. And then we have the invasion of the exotic snail that signals a lot of prey. And then finally, you know, we end up with these nesting events on Payne's Prairie, which is, you know, bringing it back to where kites were historically. 
but in a new way because we still have landscape modifications and there are so many more people using habitat in so many different ways. Well, but what does this mean for the future? And what about climate change? And what about the hurricanes that brought the high water in the first place? Even though this extreme weather event of Hurricane Irma is what brought high water, those conditions need to persist. And so with climate change, we can expect more frequent hurricanes, which could result in more high water events. Sweetwater functions as a treatment wetland. It was designed and built to filter nutrient-rich water that's coming out of Gainesville. There's an Irving Creek that flows into the prairie from Gainesville, and it picks up nutrients from stormwater runoff. It picks up nutrients from wastewater treatment. And so when it flows into the wetlands, it, it slows down, it gets filtered, it gets cleaned. Wetlands are they're kind of like nature's kidneys. They naturally filter a lot of pollutants and they, they really do a great job of removing nitrogen. Their ability to nest and to survive in these wetland areas is closely tied to hydrology. So they need water and they need substrate in order to nest properly, but then they need more like open patches of water with less substrate. And so even though that's all contained within a wetland, the wetland has to be patchy in a way to accommodate them. And when the water recedes, for instance, in a drought year, we know that causes problems for snail kites. And so that tends to trigger dispersal of birds, right? When your wetland dries up, you need to move and find a new wetland. And in ecology, it's never one factor. It's just all about good wetland management and about considering kites and what their habitat needs are. There are not too many big old wetlands in the region for kites to disperse to if Payne's Prairie becomes the less viable option. Snail kites were not well known from a lot of areas of North Florida where we think that they would or could be. And so it turns out that having breeding on Payne's Prairie to the extent that we've had for the past two to three breeding seasons is a big deal, especially for a critically endangered species like this.